I'm going to talk to you about DNA, the barcode that makes you who you are, the thing that makes everybody completely different from everybody else. When I was doing biology A-level in the 70s, we were told that one day we might be able to read DNA and one day it might be able to help us identify people from each other. Well, we can do that now. Your DNA is a little bit like a ladder. A ladder with thir three million rungs. And if you put every single one of those rungs into a bag and jumble them up, take them out one at a time and put them on your ladder either way round and then do it again, that's the amount of different ways that each person is built up. So the odds of two people having the same DNA are infinitesimal, except for, for identical twins. Now, in the 80s, it was the first time that DNA identification was used in a legal case. A boy from Ghana had come and emigrated with his mother and his siblings to the UK, and he went home for a visit. When he came back again, the authorities thought that there was something wrong with his passport and he wasn't the same person that went out there. And they tried to say that he was trying to come in under a false passport and that he wasn't the son of the mother who said he was. Well, a woman from an immigration charity called Sheena York said, actually, I think there's a professor I've heard of that might be able to do something about this. And he said, no, no, we haven't really got that far with DNA yet. But he worked on it and he looked at it and he looked at the DNA of the mother and he looked at the DNA of the siblings and he matched the two mixes up and said, yes, there's no doubt at all that this child belongs to this mother. So therefore, it was proved that he should be in this country and he was allowed to stay. Other cases, for example, Richard III, when he was found in a car park in Leicester, which at the moment is slightly more famous for something else, with, they, were, they were pretty sure that this, the skeleton was old and they were pretty sure it was the same formation as perhaps Richard III. But by checking out his siblings and looking at people that were related to Richard III, they said, yep, yeah, we definitely have found the skeleton of a king in a car park and he's been reinterred in Leicester Cathedral. It's also been used more recently in a cold case where a rape and murder in 1985, I think, hadn't been solved, and only recently, the daughter of the killer, who'd kept quiet all those years, was taken into custody for something else, gave a DNA sample. This sample was checked on the database, and it matched this guy, who they then arrested and locked up for the murder that he committed all those years ago. And, of, and we know that it uh, solves cases. But how much DNA do we need? What do we know about the amount of DNA that's needed? Well, actually, it's not very much. One DNA strand, which gives you a full sample to identify you, is one nanometer big. And to let you know how big a nanometer is, there are 60,000 nanometers for the width of a human hair. So the amount of DNA that is needed to identify you is pretty small. So if I was thinking of committing a crime, and I didn't want to pass my DNA on and get my DNA on, say, a gun or a knife or something, then the sensible thing to do would be to put a pair of gloves on. So that if I picked up this weapon, for example, it wouldn't have my DNA on it. Now, if you could pass me that bottle of water, please, Ingrid. If you just pass that bottle of water forward, which Ingrid kindly brought me earlier. Now, my DNA is not on this bottle of water because I've got gloves on. But Ingrid's DNA is on it. And Ingrid's DNA is now my gloves. And Ingrid's DNA is now on this candlestick. And that's how easy it is to pass DNA on in a secondary fashion. So if that had been used to kill somebody, my DNA isn't on it, but the few people here who touched that bottle of water, which I haven't touched with my hands, 
the DNA has been passed over onto a weapon. And also, if you went shopping and you went and picked up something like a bottle of shampoo or something and thought, now that's not the one for me, and put it back down again, and then somebody else picked that bottle of shampoo up, took it home, touched something in their house, there your DNA is then moved somewhere completely different to somewhere you've never been. And to illustrate that, I'll tell you a story. A guy called Wesley decided he wanted to buy a car. He'd seen a car in the local area that was for sale. A couple of lads that he knew were selling this Volvo. So he said, can I give it a test drive? And they said, yep. So he insured himself on it for the day because he wanted to give it a good run round. So obviously as he's sitting in this car, he's driving it about, he had it for a few hours. He didn't actually decide he wanted it. So he took it back, he gave it back to these brothers. Two or three days later, this car was used in a drive-by shooting and a 20-something-year-old father was shot as he was riding his bicycle and he died. Two, again, later on, as the police were investigating, they found the car had been burnt out and there was one link back to Wesley and that was that he insured himself on that car. Not only that, there was a phone call on his phone that took him back to the brothers that were selling the car. And when they investigated in the house and found a couple of balaclavas and a pair of gloves, Wesley's DNA was on the gloves. Wesley hadn't been in, worn those gloves. Wesley hadn't been in the car when the shooting occurred. But the guys who were wearing those gloves had held on to the steering wheel and the gear stick. So Wesley's DNA had transferred the, onto those gloves. And to cut a long story short, although he had a watertight alibi, which of course the police weren't going to believe because his DNA was on the gloves and he did know these brothers, DNA, Wesley's now doing 27 years for murder. So it's a cautionary tale and to be fair, that sort of thing doesn't happen that often. But the point is, that if we are going to be using one nanometer of DNA to identify somebody, when it can be moved into somewhere else, as easily as that, everywhere you go, DNA is passed. Everything you touch, you're passing your DNA on. If you pick up one of those Bibles in the pews in front of you, you're getting somebody else's DNA on your hands, which you could take home. If someone drives your car and then you drive it and go somewhere else in the country, a friend of ours often borrows our car, so her DNA could be in our cottage in Cornwall because she's past had her DNA. It's just a case of maybe we should be looking at larger DNA samples when we're looking for who they belong to and where they were at the time that it was passed on to something. Thank you.